Good day and welcome to the CDI Talks. My name is Anton Shekhatsov and I chair the Center for Democratic Integrity. It's a non-profit organization based in Austria and uh, we analyze and uh, we analyze attempts of authoritarian regimes to influence European politics and societies. And my guest today is Sergei uh, Haritonov. Uh, Sergei is a leading expert of iSense, an international expert group established in 2018 and aimed at detecting, analyzing, and countering hybrid, uh, hybrid threats against democracy, rule of law, and sovereignty of states in Western, Central, and Eastern Europe and Eurasia. Thank you for joining me today, Serge. Thanks a lot for inviting. Um, a year ago, Alexander Lukashenko stole the presidential elections in Belarus and with the help of intimidation and, and outright fraud and proclaimed himself a president of Belarus. Uh, Belarusian people took to the streets to protest against Lukashenko's regime, and those protests became the largest, as far as I understand, the largest protests in Belarusian history. Uh, Lukashenko's inhuman brutality in cracking down on, on the protests has shocked many in the West and beyond. I'm sure that the protests will run through our conversation today, but uh, let me first ask this. Uh, as you may know, if we look at Russia, if we, if we look at Azerbaijan, if we look even at Ukraine under President uh, Viktor Yanukovych, when they want or wanted to steal elections, but still maintain a facade of international legitimacy, they would invite so-called fake observers, you know, foreign politicians, journalists, activists who officially come to monitor elections, but in fact are just invited to simply say that elections are free and fair and democratic. Last year, we saw nothing like this in Belarus. There were no OSCE observers, um, you know, coming from uh, OSCE Odir, a uh, well-established organization that provides monitoring of the elections. But also, there were no usual, these fake observers friendly to authoritarian regimes. What explains this? Didn't Lukashenko regime not care about even a facade of international legitimacy? That's absolutely right. Uh, he's the kind of person who uh, never really cared about international procedures or international legislation, not to speak about the, the, the national legislation or procedures. Uh, for him, uh, being the president is like becoming a king. Uh, so uh, if you rule once, you rule forever. That's uh, the ideology, one of a few ideologies that Lukashenko was uh, following uh, since he became a president in a fairly... Uh, um, democratic elections in mid nineties, uh, and uh, to say, <laughs> uh, to to add on top of that, these were the last uh, elections that were recognized by the international community in, in mid nineties when Lukashenko became uh, the legitimate president. It was his first and last legitimate and legal term. So, uh, speaking in, in purely legal and uh, um, a legislative uh, language. Lukashenko has, ha has never been a real president of Belarus uh, since 1999, when his uh, first mandate was over. Uh, but uh, he still maintained certain legitimacy among the population, or so uh, people say, because there, there's been no sociology, there's been uh, no real uh, democratic institutions, there, there's been no independence of the branches of power. So it's really hard to say what Belarus really was within uh, those 27 years under Lukashenko's rule and w what the reality was. I'm pretty sure that it will be really exciting for all of us to uh, open the archives of uh, Lukashenko's uh, period once uh, the regime is over. And um, I'm pretty sure that everyone will be shocked by the uh, real levels of support that he maintained since uh, certain units of state security still maintain um, what might be acknowledged as uh, uh, secret sociology just to uh, have a glimpse of what real situation is. But according to uh, what uh, uh, according to what happened last year, uh, we may say that Lukashenko has no legitimacy whatsoever, neither internal, no international, and he, he is not a legal head of state, which is acknowledged by both the, the European Union, the United States, and their international partners. But Lukashenko seems not to care about that, since he still maintains control over the um, uh, punitive apparatus, which uh, is more likely uh, to become uh, sort of mercenaries, uh, mainly because they do not follow the procedures, they do not follow the 
um, terms that um, define what, uh, for instance, law enforcement system is. So we may effectively say that Lukashenko now maintains an army uh, of uh, mercenaries, mostly represented by the KGB and his Minister of Interior. There are still questions about uh, the army as such, since army is based on the conscripts who are not professional, um, not uh, professionally trained uh, militants with, uh, you know, some crazy uh, ideological background in their heads. Although, although there's great portion of ideology that is being flushed into their heads uh, every day with uh, so-called politinformatia when uh, the members of the army are forced to watch uh, state television in the evening, which is a separate uh, discussion. But indeed, uh, we, we speak about a person who maintains uh, control over the country in, in a military fashion and who effectively runs a military junta. When we talk about uh, the international legitimacy, I know that, uh, and probably you would agree, that Lukashenko still tried to play with the EU and also with Russia, like, like you know, being in between. And playing with the EU always, uh, always features this element of legitimacy. Yeah, you, you need to be at least a bit legitimate in order to talk to the EU. Now I think this legitimacy evaporated. I think there is no trust on the part of the EU uh, concerning Lukashenko's regime. But last year, I, was, I wasn't following really closely the Belarusian elections, but I did notice that Lukashenko tried to play a little bit of an anti-Russian card. I don't know how cynical or how honest he was when playing this anti-Russian card, but it also meant or implied that he would probably would like he would probably like to see some international or some Western support, at least because of, of playing this anti-Russian card. But still, he didn't care about you know even fake observers, and that 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 really surprised me. Um, what what do you think about this? Lukashenko is a person who doesn't really have um, any stable ideology, and this is something that is not always understood by the West. Uh, so. For five, six years, he, he, he was playing the card of the donor of stability uh, of uh, Eastern European uh, Switzerland. Uh, and this is the card that he was playing based on the events uh, in the occupied Crimea and uh, uh, in the territories of Donbass. Um, prior to that, he was playing the card of the uh, Slavic integrator, the, 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 the fighter who wants to unite the, the uh, territories of the former Soviet Union. And he was playing this card pretty successfully in the 90s uh, when he was still competing with Boris Yeltsin. But after Vladimir Putin became the president, Putin showed him uh, the, the, the door and he explained the rules. So Lukashenko stopped uh, his huge rallies across Russia. Uh, since he was still dreaming of becoming the uh, emperor of this new newly born uh, Soviet Union too, which never happened. And I believe would never happen now. Uh, he is the guy who, who does not follow the rules. He is the guy who does not follow the uh, ideology and does not have it. He, he's using various kinds of ideological establishments uh, as his tactics, but he does not have a strategy. So yesterday he was fighting against uh, uh, NATO and European Union. Uh, today he's fighting against Russians. Tomorrow he will be fighting uh, for sovereignty against uh, um, aliens. He, he needs uh, the enemy. He needs some sort of uh, image of the other and philosophical other uh, to rebuild and reclaim his status. And he was playing it very well until last year when it, it became clear, not just for the people inside the country, but also for the West, that uh, he he's not a person who, who is building uh, unions with someone. His mere goal is to maintain power. And uh, for this goal, he, he will be ready to uh, join NATO. He will be ready to join uh, the uh, CSTO, um, any kind of organization, uh, for as long as he can remain in power. And he had this sort of honeymoon with the West uh, since 2014 until last year. And I believe that his expectation uh, was that the people would not sustain uh, long protests and that uh, the show that he um, played previously uh, within all previous uh, election uh, periods would play a game. But it didn't work out uh, because he does not have internal support inside the country. And uh, I think that this was his greatest mistake. 
what I find really, really interesting, and especially given my own interest in, in, in the relations between the European far-right movements, uh, on the one hand, and authoritarian regimes outside of the EU, uh, I remember back in 2018, uh, the, the, the misleadingly named party, Liberal Democratic Party of Belarus, uh, run by uh, Sergei Gaidukevich, um, basically it's an uh, illiberal... Alec, anti- Alec, Alec Gaidukevich. Oleg Edukovic, sorry. Uh, basically, it's an illiberal anti-Western party. Uh, it has nothing to do with liberal democracy. It pretends to be in the opposition to Lukashenko. Probably now it even does not really pretend anymore. Um, but it announced in 2018 that it wanted to hold a, a so-called Congress of Patriotic Parties in Europe, in Minsk. Uh, the capital of Belarus. And they claimed that they had invited several representatives of European far-right parties, including Freedom Party of Austria, uh, Alternative for Germany, and French National Front. And uh, the Congress would discuss patriotism, conservatism, national conservatism, and social conservatism. This is what they claimed. As I understand, the, the Congress never took place uh, in Minsk or elsewhere. And, uh, but there, there are confirmed uh, contacts between Gajdukevich and the leader of this party and uh, Austrian far-right politicians. My question is, what was the point of those contacts? Uh, do you think that it was an independent initiative of Gajdukevich or anyone in his party? Or was it coming from uh, somebody you know, inside Lukashenko's circles, like, you know, political advisors? What was the point of all these contacts? Well, the, the point is very simple. They, they need legitimization. And uh, in order to show that uh, they have supporters in the European Union, uh, they need someone on the other side. So uh, the state propaganda represents uh, the people from marginal parties or the, the far right parties uh, or, uh, let's say, the populist parties as uh, legitimate and major representatives of uh, Europe. So uh, for the, the general public in Belarus and for the elderly people who watch state television, um, this seems like a big deal. It seems for them that like the Europe is listening to Lukashenko, the Europe is following his orders, and uh, the state propaganda is just building the alternative reality in which uh, members of uh, small parties or members of marginal parties that sometimes do not have representation uh, in national parliaments or uh, the European Parliament are represented as the people who uh, really run European politics. And uh, propaganda is doing this really well since they maintain full control on uh, uh, television format, uh, which means it's really hard to address the same audience for alternative powers or the democratic movement. Uh, however, after August 2020, the television has lost uh, its audience. And uh, surprisingly, the people who are the most trusted in the country are not even the, the religious leaders or uh, the democratic politicians, but independent journalists. And it, it, it was a huge discovery when uh, the, the demographics on, on that matter were published last year. Uh, it, it was a big surprise for me because uh, for many, many years, uh, the independent journalism was I wouldn't say abandoned by the, by the audience, but uh, the, the people were underestimated. And uh, it was a big recovery for, for the people from the journalism community that they finally were heard and that uh, their opinions uh, and their work really mattered to the people. But uh, going back again uh, to these Haidukevich's uh, context, it's actually quite interesting uh, that um, Guy Dukevich, or at least his party, was also involved in lobbying activities paid by Hussein's regime when it were, when Hussein was still in power. There is some research showing that uh, Hussein's regime was paying to uh, uh, liberal, the Liberal Democratic Party of Belarus to do lobbying activities in Europe. Also, Hussein's regime thought. I think it's now the situation is quite the same. Hussein needed some international legitimacy. It needed to show to uh, his own people that there are some friendly forces in Europe. And um, Guy Dukevich's party was one of those uh, parties that provided this uh, facade of, of international legitimacy. But how independent is or was Haidukevich? Uh, do you think it was, you know, bringing these European politicians from far-right parties, do you think it was his initiative or should it be 
should it have always been, you know, somehow agreed with Lukashenko's political advisors? I don't think it was his private initiative, and it's really important to bring up the context of who Oleg Dukevich is himself. Um, so his father was uh, playing a certain role of, let's say, quasi-opposition in Lukashenko's system since early 90s. And Gedukevich himself was one of the uh, um, officers uh, at a major police station in Minsk. So he, he was the person who was directly involved in uh, repressions against democratic activists uh, before he became the head of, the, uh, of this political uh, movement. Uh, I would say that in a system like Belarus, uh, where the politics did not exist uh, for a very long time and everything was under control, uh, no political power that uh, plays a neutral uh, role or pretends to play a neutral role and be uh, uh, independent, uh, but still supports Lukashenko, is doing something on their own. Uh, Lukashenko is using this party for his purposes uh, in the same way as he's using the so-called professional unions of Belarus um, that are, in fact, a prolongation of, uh, the, of the bodies that are being used for control over the society and um, uh, who, who create this simulacre of uh, uh, the labor unions or trade unions, but in fact are only being used to promote propaganda among the workers and to maintain control over um, the people in uh, specific factories. So I, I wouldn't be sure that uh, Gaidukevich did that on himself, mainly because inviting foreign politicians is a matter of national security in Belarus. Uh, and uh, without Lukashenko's uh, support or without uh, letting him know, I don't think something like that might happen. And I would believe the initiative wasn't coming from uh, Gaidukevich himself, but it was something that was uh, ex uh, imposed on them from the top. Because if Lukashenko invited these people himself, that would be a little bit uh, too toxic for him. But for someone like Gaidukevich, who still maintains support for Lukashenko and plays the card of being a liberal democrat, uh, it's, it's all right to invite people like that because his reputation never existed. Mm -hmm. uh, right after the beginning of the protest uh, last year, uh, did you see any uh, attempts on, on the part of Lukashenko's regime to establish contacts with friendly politicians in the EU? Because I think... Um, in, in, in a way, Lukashenko's regime does present itself as a sort of uh, socialist, a communist country. So uh, potentially it could have support from you know, left-wing or far-left organizations and parties in the EU. So did you see those contacts? And uh, perhaps uh, it, Lukashenko also tried maybe to um, uh, use some lobbying groups in the EU. Did you see any of this? Oh, indeed. Uh, in uh, mid 2000s, he was using the, the services of Lord Bell in uh, Great Britain to uh, establish a new image and to, to change the uh, opinion of the West on him, which didn't really work out. He, he was still in touch with uh, the Europeans. The European Union was doing uh, business with Belarus, even despite all the violations that existed long before August 2020. And there were it wasn't the same scale of repressions, but the repressions still existed. Uh, so it was a matter that the European Union could uh, accept, and they, they still continue to do business with uh, Lukashenko and uh, the Republic of Belarus as such. Uh, but uh, after the events in Ukraine, and uh, I mean specifically Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine in 2014, uh, Lukashenko... Probably he felt some danger from Vladimir Putin, but he's also realized it was uh, his moment of glory to uh, seize his status as uh, the last dictator of, of Europe because there was Vladimir Putin now, who was the second dictator. Uh, and Lukashenko played this card really well. He um, maintained new connections with the West uh, through arranging Minsk, Minsk peace talks or rather providing a platform um, he, he was not playing any role in, in, in the peace talks themselves, but uh, he uh, made really good job with uh, image making. Um, and uh, for the propaganda, it was their moment of glory as well to show Lukashenko as one of the greatest leaders of modern world who brought together Vladimir Putin, 
uh, European politicians, uh, Piotr Poroshenko, and all these people gathering in Minsk. It was huge success for him. I mean, ideologically, it was it was a big deal. And uh, since then, uh, the European Union um, got hooked uh, to the idea of uh, uh, Belarus uh, being the uh, donor of stability, as Lukashenko called it. Uh, and uh, there's been a wide range of uh, high-level conferences held in Minsk. Um, there, there's been uh, a platform uh, called Minsk Dialogue that was funded by the West, and uh, Lukashenko took part in, in, in their conference uh, on security uh, that took place in Minsk. And uh, there were great expectations of Lukashenko himself. No, no, no one else believed in this, but th there was a great expectation that Belarus will become a platform uh, for uh, or location for for global peace talks, uh, a place similar to Switzerland. Um, this idea was over in August 2020, and uh, uh, today Belarus is not considered donor of stability, not just because there's no stability inside, but also because it exports house uh, into neighboring countries. Did uh, Lukashenko's regime still maintain uh, friends in the EU uh, after the well this violent crackdown on the opposition and the protests? Not publicly. It's it, it has become really uh, difficult for them to maintain such contacts, just because any conversation with Lukashenko causes the explosion of public opinion, and uh, he he became so toxic that uh, not even his old friends are willing to meet him. So. Uh, so far, he met with uh, um, the head of the government of Russia, the president of Russia, the president of Georgia, the president of Azerbaijan, and I think someone in um, uh, Central Asia. Compared to President-elect Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who met with uh, the leaders of more than 30 countries. Lukashenko is a person who will not sustain uh, any... Um, let's say, uh, reboot of, of uh, diplomacy or politics uh, with the European Union or the United States. This is the opinion in uh, most cabinets uh, or the most offices uh, within the European Union and in Washington, D.C. There is no way back. Uh, both uh, Brits and Americans consider him a, rock, um, a, a representative of rock regime. Uh, the British newspapers, including, uh, let's say, Financial Times, already call him uh, the, the rock regime. So for the West, he has become a person who is comparable to Muammar Gaddafi um, or Slobodan Milosevic. The, there is no way back and there's not a single chance Lukashenko can um, come back to the normality uh, that existed before 2020 and there will be no business as usual anymore. After the hijacking of the Ryanair flight uh, earlier this year and the, uh, in the Belarus uh, airspace and the kidnapping of independent journalist Roman Protasevich and his girlfriend, we witnessed a massive campaign aimed at discrediting Protasevich in the eyes of the West. Not, not even in the eyes of Belarusians or Russians, but in the eyes of the West. And uh, this campaign was somehow very similar to the campaign against the uh, Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, after he survived the assassination attempt and uh, was imprisoned in Russia. Have you looked into this campaign against Protasevich? Who were the main actors there? Indeed, uh, I since made a research on that matter, and uh, we were surprised that uh, the narrative of uh, Roman Protasevich being a neo-Nazi, which was absolutely fake, uh, was created uh, by the anonymous website called FOIA Research, which is very popular in Greece, a country where uh, the uh, Ryanair plane left from. And uh, FOIA Research is a website that mimics uh, to an online platform that uh, wants to discover the documents of American government through uh, FOIA, uh, a specific legislation that allows uh, the public to uh, get access to the documents of the American government. Those that were um, secret at the time uh, were the documents that are yet unpublished. Um, so in reality, this website is uh, uh, targeting um, the Ukrainians mostly. It, uh, it, it builds fake narratives about uh, the European Union, the United States, 
And when we uh, checked the, the connections between this website and the external world, it was impossible to find out who's actually publishing the story because FOIA Research was the first to publish a huge article about uh, Roman Protasevich, represented him as neo-Nazi, as a person who was fighting against civilians uh, within the Azov regiment, and so on and so forth, the person who was involved in killings. So uh, we found out that the, the website was anonymous, that there was no uh, way to find out who uh, it was connected to, but on their Twitter, the first tweets since uh, FOIA research established that their account were related to uh, American websites uh, that are connected uh, to Russia Today and Sputnik uh, in, in a way that they are either being used uh, to promote the, the materials of this website or their creators uh, were connected uh, to this media, used to work for them or still maintain connection uh, with uh, these outlets um, fully funded by the Kremlin. So it was clear that the, the promotion of this narrative in the West is uh, related to Russia Today and Sputnik, who supported this uh, with uh, great energy. And surprisingly, uh, the promotion was uh, so fast and so energetic that um, although the material about Protasevich was initially published on a marginal anonymous website, it was soon republished by the friendly media related to far uh, left uh, or communist groups in Greece. Then it was um, updated, then it was updated, legitimized by these media and was republished by major media. And by the end of the day, it was already on CNN uh, on the Greek version of the website. So it, it was an effective operation of misinformation that was uncovered later, but it gives uh, uh, it gives us a great insight into how uh, Russia maintains uh, its information operations in the West. You know, this uh, FOIA research, uh, if you look at, the, uh, at some of the authors of this website and some, uh, and some links to external websites, you will also see that there are connections with the COVID Action magazine, which has a history in the Cold War and was uh, founded by uh, former... Uh, CIA officer who left the service and and started to collaborate with the KGB and Cuban uh, secret services. So there is this very strange historical continuity uh, in in this case. Well, the the the, the, the accounts that were reposted by uh, the Twitter of uh, FOIA research were connected to a group of people that are being called uh, Sputnik left in America, mainly because uh, their fight against democracy is. Um, um so aggressive uh that um uh, they they are being labeled as as a separate group uh because the language they're using um against the the, the actions of uh, the american government is um, something that very much recalls the the language used by the soviet propagandists so america is called an imperialist uh, they run imperial wars and stuff like that. So it, it was exciting to, to read their articles, mainly because it's uh, something published by the people of my age who are themselves American citizens, uh, but they use the language um, that was uh, uh, the instrument of the Soviet propaganda 50 years ago. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, on the one hand, we, 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 we can say that, well, it's all ridiculous. All those marginal websites, they have no influence. But what you describe is actually a quite a successful influence operation. And it's, it, it has been conducted through what I call uh, narrative laundering. You know, it's like laundering money. Uh, when right. you publish something on the, even on the marginal website, that, that, but then it, it, it uh, penetrates the mainstream media and then the, the original source of this information or disinformation in our case is completely lost. So you know, the narrative has been laundered. That's right. That's right. What do, do you, do you see any other successful operations such as this? Regarding Belarus, so we saw this, you know, uh, with Protasevich. What else uh, do you do? You have any other examples where Belarus or its Russian allies would be successful in disinformation related to Belarus? Well, th this kind of operations uh, has been used very widely in the last five years by the uh, toxic uh, publics within Belarus that targeted Belarusian audiences, and uh, since August twenty twenty. 
um, this um, uh, narrative laundering, as you call it, is uh, being widely used by the uh, state propaganda and foremost state television. Um, the so-called presidential administration, or let's call it the, the Lukashenko's office, uh, has created a, a network of toxic um, groups on Telegram uh, or toxic publics that are being used to um, uh, introduce, uh, let's say, uh, hostage videos, uh, videos of people like Roman Protasevich who were captured by the uh, state security or mercenaries, uh, if you prefer. And um, these uh, publics that are being directly controlled by the presidential administration um, are used to send messages that are later being uh, um, repeated by the state media with a link uh, or with reference to these websites. But also these kind of things are being... Uh, these kinds of things are also being um, promoted by the state newspapers, uh, by the um, Telegram channels of propagandists who have their own channels uh, on Telegram. So th th they've built the whole infrastructure of uh, um, that kind of uh, operations that when certain narrative is uh, being launched by an anonymous uh, Telegram channel, and uh, by the end of the day, it ends in... Uh, uh, state television, uh, then it might be copied or uh, republished by the national media, or in some cases, it may be republished by the foreign press, uh, which sometimes happens, unfortunately. Do you think that in the international media, international press is the target audience, or still the domestic audience is the target audience? I would say uh, Lukashenko and his people are trying to send messages to the West, and they're trying to recapture uh, the agenda. And uh, I mean, media agenda foremost, but they are not very successful with this. Uh, for instance, the the situation with the kidnapping of Roman Protasevich and uh, his girlfriend, it, it was a chance uh, for Lukashenko to uh, just get away with this, unless uh, there were independent media, there were um, online activists who quickly found out what really happened and who let the world know what was happening. Because otherwise, uh, I believe Lukashenko had a great chance to uh, send his message, to send his agenda, and uh, we will not be discussing this uh, today just because uh, he was more successful with this operation. But uh, as we see within the last, I would say, three, four months, uh, the democratic powers uh, recaptured the agenda. Uh, although they were uh, losing for losing for a certain period, uh, where they were having weaker positions, uh, now they uh, recaptured the agenda, which, in my opinion, seems like a really promising uh, trend, just because it shows that Lukashenko is losing on the internet, and uh, if he's losing on the internet, he's losing uh, his positions in, in real life too just because people do not trust uh, the state media inside the country, but also because uh, there are so many activists and uh, forcibly displaced people who were forced out of country uh, after the peaceful revolution in August last year, that they have all connections, that they have all opportunities to tell the world what's really happening. And uh, I think th this is uh, one of the... Um, one of the main tools that the people have to really tell the truth about uh, what's going on in their country. Now we are also witnessing uh, an influence operation, um, but it's no longer just disinformation. It's a physical influence operation. It's when Lukashenko's regime is weaponizing refugees, taking them to the border with Lithuania, and basically trying to exert pressure on Lithuania and by extension on the European Union. My question here would be um, how far the Lukashenko's regime can go in this, you know, in this weaponization of refugees. Is he trying to uh, establish a dialogue with the European Union, knowing perfectly that the European Union does not really want to go to business as usual with Lukashenko? Or is it simply punishment of the EU? So... Is it an uh, invitation, a very strange invitation for to a dialogue or punishment? I think it's it, it's a mixture of both, but uh, there's more coercion. And uh, Lukashenko wants uh, to let the West 
uh, know that he's a strong politician and uh, that uh, he will force them to uh, start the conversation. I don't think it's a successful strategy. I think with the, with the latest uh, decisions of the Lithuanian Ministry of Interior and um, the, the border guards to send uh, to not allow people in and uh, to build a fence, Lukashenko will be facing more consequences himself in just last two days. So today is August 5th and uh, uh, we speak about the, the previous two days. Uh, there's been 480 migrants who were sent back uh, from Lithuania to Belarus. And these people often do not have the documents because they threw them away before they uh, were planning to cross the border. They often do not have enough funds to sustain their living and they have no job and no, no knowledge of local language. And most importantly, they have no place to go. So Lukashenko will be facing even more pro problems when he wanted to create troubles to the European Union and Lithuania. And I think Lithuania's response uh, in this situation was very effective uh, since the country had to uh, make decisions faster than the European Union overall. Uh, I don't think Lukashenko will force uh, the EU to dialogue with this. And um, I do not really see any good reasons for the EU to maintain dialogue with the person who does that. Uh, Lithuania already calls this a hybrid operation against uh, Lithuania by the Republic of Belarus, which is essentially a low-intensity conflict, probably. Uh, the, the, there are still many issues with uh, describing this in legal or uh, political terms, but Lithuania has made it clear that for them uh, this is a hybrid operation and they treat those people not as refugees but as um, the, the the participants of this hybrid operation so it's it, it's really a big issue not just politically but legally uh, and uh, it's it's new tactics that uh, wasn't used in this region uh, on a large scale previously but i guess lukashenko's and probably if that was maintained in certain collaboration with uh, with the kremlin the idea was to create the the, the internal crisis inside lithuania to uh, make Lithuanians less liberal, to make Lithuanians less leaning to democracy or uh, less supportive of democracy, and uh, to um, create the situation when Lithuanians will be willing to establish a regime that is somehow similar to the situation in Hungary. So I'm not sure Lukashenko uh, was successful with that because Lithuanians, although there were definitely people who are, who are unhappy about uh, the Lithuanian policy, um, until recently, um, I, I think Lithuanians entirely understand that what, what is being done by the um, Lukashenko regime against their country is made to show how weak Lithuania is and is causing the opposite re reaction among the population of uh, this country. So I think instead of weakening Lithuania, Lukashenko did the opposite. And now he, he's facing the consequences of the operation that was targeting uh, whom he considered his enemies. Thank you for this con conversation, Sergei. Uh, wish you and all the Belarusian people all the best in the fight uh, for freedom and democracy in this country. And I also thank our audience. And if you like this video, you may want to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive notifications about new episodes of CDI Talks. Thank you very much. Thank you.